Good afternoon, everyone. I am Belinda Cheesboro, STEM Education Specialist at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I'm here to share the stories of African Americans and the experience and impacts they've had and continue to have on American culture because of their STEM contributions. Through the Window and Into the Mirror is a video conversation series about the experiences of African American STEM professionals today. This time around, we are focusing on innovation, advocacy, and advancement in the field of tech. During our sessions together, students will peer into the windows of the speakers' lives and learn from their lived experiences. They will also find parts of their culture and lifestyle mirrored in their stories. To everyone listening, it is our hope that you leave here with information, inspiration, and plans for action as you take your first steps towards having careers in STEM. This program is generously supported by Dow. Now, let's meet our speakers. Malika and Miles George are biological engineering PhD students at MIT. They graduated from MIT with a degree in biological engineering and a minor in African and African diaspora studies. Recently, they have started social media accounts on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Discord, promoting STEM and higher education in fun and relatable ways. As Black students in the STEM community, they aim to spread science advocacy and diversity to students of all ages. They want to increase the number of people interested in the sciences and higher education through virtual presentations to students in K through 12 education. Welcome Malik and Miles. I am so excited to speak with you today while engaging the teachers, students, and family of students watching this interview. Now, let's move on to our first question. So please tell us about yourselves, specifically like the work that you do, um, the program that you'll be entering in and anything else that you think is important for us to know. No, I don't think I- Oh, Miles, are you, is, is this good? Yeah. That's much better. Okay, my mic was muted. Okay. Sorry, but yes, we just finished our undergraduate degree at MIT in biological engineering. Uh, we took the summer off to focus on ourselves before starting the long journey of a PhD at same school uh, in biological engineering. We have not chosen a lab yet or a specific specialization yet. That will be this fall. And we plan to continue uh, our STEM outreach along the way, which we'll talk about during this interview. Okay, is there anything that you would like to add Malik? Um, I guess just some background, I guess, is that we're originally from New Jersey, um, went, been in the same about central New Jersey, suburban town, pretty much our whole life. And yeah, we moved up into the Cambridge, Boston area for college. And we've been here for this is beginning our fifth year now. Wow, that's really awesome. You both are especially at MIT and you're staying at MIT or graduate school, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So let's move on to your childhoods. So we're going to start from when you guys were both really young. Um, so growing up, did you have interests in STEM? Uh, to be honest, uh, when we were really young, we wanted to be chefs, which is very ironic seeing that none of us can cook. Um, but we had this whole plan to build a restaurant. And I think we actually liked the building the restaurant more than the actual uh, being cooks part but um as we got uh, a little older into like the middle school era and we had our first science classes that's when we actually um gained our kind of interest in stem and biology specifically so first i have to ask what made you interested in becoming chefs and deciding to have this whole plan to be restaurant owners at some point so our mom has an allergy to shellfish and we always wanted to go uh, to seafood places. And so we had the brilliant idea that we would make a, uh, a restaurant that had a section for, uh, for people with allergies. Um, and then we were like, okay, we'll manage the restaurant, we'll zone it properly so that there'll be no contaminants and then we'll also cook in the back. And then we realized that we didn't really like fruit 
Uh, so we figured that was going to not work out. Also, the fact that restaurants like with seafood or hypo out can have allergy sections anyway. So our idea was ruined before we got older. So then we decided, yeah, science is probably the way to go. Yeah. That was very sweet of you, though, to do that in consideration of your mother who has shellfish allergies. But so you said that as you got older and you forgo the the restaurant idea and became more interested in STEM, particularly biology, what about biology made you interested in it versus the other areas of science and technology and engineering mathematics? Mm -hmm. um, well, specifically, I guess, and um, I can pinpoint this memory in sixth grade, um, we were reading the biology textbook for whatever reason and towards the end there was this very uh cool study we were reading about where they took the bad genetic parts of bacteria out um and then they added in the gene to produce human insulin and that if you like scaled it up to like a manufacturing level that's how most um insulin is made um to uh for sale and to use and from there, we really kind of learned the power of biology and genetic engineering, and we kind of progressed on that path uh, for a while. That's really cool. That kind of reminds me when I was also in elementary school in like fourth or fifth grade, I remember always being excited to read the science textbook and to look at um, the various chapters of things that I'll be learning, but I was more interested in the astronomy portions rather than the biology portions. But that, that just reminded me of my childhood. Do you have anything to add to that, Miles? Even in elementary school, uh, our parents always bought us different science kits. Um, I guess that's more of a uh, construction and like mechanical engineering side, but we always used to tinker with stuff. We had an RC car that we decided to dismantle to take the circuit board out of. And we almost set the carpet on fire, but no, it was only smoke. But uh, we always tinkered with stuff like that, using our hands and using different, uh, using different toys all around that air. So once we read, got into biology, it kind of all made sense. That's really cool. And not the not cool part is setting the carpet on fire. Well, almost setting on fire. Mm -hmm. so, but. That's really cool that your parents got you those little projects that you could use to tinker with um, to become more interested. So I guess that counts towards the positive experiences that you had with STEM from like reading science textbooks when you're in elementary school to working on little projects that your parents probably found to keep you engaged and have something to do. So are there any other experiences that you had in relation to STEM that were positive growing up? Uh, let's see. If we're not going into high school, I'm not sure if high school will come up later. Uh, if, if we're talking about early, you can include high school as well. That's okay. part of the childhood. Okay. Aspect. Well, before high school, yeah. I'll go to uh, the TV we watched. Uh, if anyone here knows Cyber Chase or Federal Rough Ruffman uh, or this older show Zoom, these are what we used to watch at about four o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. We used to have a deal with our parents to let us come home, watch the show, and then do our homework. Um, so we probably watch those STEM and uh, education-based shows uh, at least five times a week. As for other stuff we did in school, in middle and high school, um, we were fortunate that our schools had science fair programs. Um, even I think in fourth grade, our school had like a fourth grade science competition, you know, the old, the old classic uh, bacon soda volcano when you put the blue ribbon on. Um, but from then we did some, but I'll say biology related studies in middle school, not too much you can do. But then in high school, we really started getting into it where there was both a class and club dedicated to it. And so we did several animal studies, um, starting with zebrafish, which was done in our house. Um, our mom did not like that. Uh, we had fruit flies. Now fruit flies uh, breed quickly and can escape. So we switched to what I call fruit walks, which are fruit flies. They don't have wings, um, but they're not technically ants. 
And then junior year, we did a very large project where we actually uh, bred mice in our attic. Uh, my parents were not happy when we said we are going to bring uh, what they said, quotes, rats into the house. Um, but they soon uh, became accustomed to the lifestyle until they were uh, donated to an exotic pet shop. And that's all I can legally say about that. But um, through that, we really got kind of our feel for doing experiments and the various things you can do in biology. Sounds like you guys were little mad scientists growing up doing all these experience, experiments and investigating like the breeding rate of like various species. That's like, it doesn't, it that sounds it, very it, entertaining. <laughs> You know, it didn't sound as as wild while you you're going through high school, but when Malik summarized it like that, yeah, it was probably a lot. So mm-hmm. I want to take this time to apologize to our parents. <laughs> bless your bless your parents for <laughs> being so accommodating and willing and and going through that process with both. Of you. So. While growing up, I'm going to assume that your parents are part of this, but who were your biggest role models and influences while you're growing up? Well, well, just, yeah, definitely parents and family as a whole. They definitely supported us and asked about kind of pushed us in uh, in uh, in good directions again. Uh, no, we are no longer pursuing uh, being chefs. <laughs> um, and so, you know, um, I, I, I remember when we said that uh, years later, my mom said that I was so happy when you guys found science. <laughs> but um, besides uh, direct family, um, let's see. My own directly come to mind. Uh, we've had set, uh, really good teachers and really inspirational and exciting teachers along the way. Um in fourth grade, I had a science teacher who she always had plant plants in her uh, in her classroom, and she had she would raise caterpillars uh, in the classroom. One of the plants that she gave us is a spider plant. Um, we she gave them away because they uh, anyway. We have that plant, and it's in our kitchen at home, and so we've had it for at least. 11 years and when we just got moved into our apartment today the offspring of that plant that was given to us is now in our apartment so like that plant from that teacher has been a part of our our lives for over half of it in middle school again really cool science teachers this one teacher he his room was the only science room in the basement because he basically had about 16 tanks of whatever animal he could uh get his hands on uh we got to take care of his frogs for a summer or toads excuse me they were toads uh Mm -hmm. he needed us to watch his toads while he was going off to explore someplace but uh toads crayfish sick did he have cichlids i think so Mm -hmm. um somehow a snake walk went into his classroom it wasn't his but i guess it knew it went to the right place And so that was a very cool environment. And then in high school, our science research teacher was truly an inspiration, always uh, helping us foster new ideas and experiments to work on. Um, She would always support us when we would say, uh, do you think we could do a mouse project in four months? And she was like, I don't see why not. And so, um, yeah, we've had really had some really inspirational teachers uh, in our education growing up. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. Especially again, like they're keep giving you all these experiences with especially working with animals and like investigating the nature around you and things like that. That's really cool. So aside from all the science experiments that you little mad scientists were up to <laughs> throughout the years, what are some other hobbies slash interests that interest that you had while growing up? Um let's see games in general. Um and this could range from board games to puzzles especially with family um every, there would be at least maybe like one um jigsaw puzzle um on a table at once i remember this one specific one that was it was all pieces of candy and it was like a thousand pieces 
and all lollipops look the same when they are uh, cut apart. But um, things like that, various board games, a lot of like word association kind of games. Um, and then when we got older, um, a lot of video games as well, um, especially with friends. We're very big um, social um, social hobby people in general. That's really cool, especially like usually when people think of games, as you're saying, like you go do video games, but you also included board games in there because of the social aspect and the word association games, too. It seems like there's like just learning throughout every um, hobby and interest that you've had while growing up. Like every hobby was somehow related to like learning or engaging, whether it's with like interpersonal relationships or just language and science in general. Do you have anything to add to that, Miles? Oh, I was just thinking back on that puzzle that took us about two months to finish, and then Absolutely. we lost three pieces, and uh, the whole house was a wreck. Uh, but uh, no, yeah, the board games. Um, we always try to buy a new board game. Uh, we at this point we probably have at least fifteen distinct board games that we've gotten uh, over the years. Um, some range from just four people to all the way up to ten people. A lot of them have to do with deceit and lying to people. I don't know if that's a good thing, but those tend to be pretty fun. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have a lot of different types of games. Uh, some can take hours to play. Some you do in rounds. So we have a good mix. Mm -hmm. So which board games are y'all the best at and which ones are you the worst at? We cannot do the deceit games if Malik and I are on the opposite teams yes we can tell when each other are lying if we were on the same team it's pretty hard for us to lose mm, okay mm -hmm. so remind me to never challenge you both when you're on the same team <laughs> yes yeah. yes built-in uh uh corroborate collaborators yeah okay so now moving on to undergrad which you just finished so it's fresh in your mind um where did you go for undergrad so we went to MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and we uh, majored in biological engineering at MIT. We're weird and all of our majors are numbers. So that's course 20. And then we minored in African, African diaspora studies. And that was taking a lot of classes relating to, for us, we focus in African-American diaspora, ranging from history, sociology, some art and music, as well as also taking some of the same classes relating to Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, so I I completely understand why you would pick the, was it biotechnology? Bioengineering. Major, yeah. mm -hmm. bioengineering. I understand that given your history with biology. <laughs> But what made you want to pursue African and African studies, African and African diaspora studies as a minor alongside that? Growing up, besides all the uh, wacky science stuff we did, we always uh, were raised with a very large sense of uh, self in our culture. Um, a, lot of our a lot of our family uh, is from the South and we are probably at least Six, genera six generational African-American. And it's something that I'm very conscious of and I've always been throughout my entire life. And just seeing different uh, inequities and inequalities in the world, especially in science, um, we decided to pursue the minor to learn more about the disparity so that whenever we go into research in our uh, higher education, uh, we can always work on issues that are central to the issues that really face our community versus trying to just work on uh, generic, I guess, solutions that mm -hmm. help everybody. We, we really want to stay focused on fixing the inequalities that exist. And so we thought we'd have to, we figured we should learn more about uh, different black inequalities here and different uh, world black inequalities before moving forward in science. Wow, that's really amazing that you were thinking about that that age and wanting to incorporate that with your love of science as well. So I'm, I'm curious about what do you mean regarding the generic 
solutions that people have towards trying to address these inequities and disparities in between like for minorities and being in STEM. Right. Yeah. So oh, oh. uh yes, I'll go first. Mm. Not every I'm not saying that like why generic that they're not good and that they're great, but typically like technology, um when it advances, uh it just raises the overall bar for what the society's advances are and it doesn't diminish any gap in who has technology for example certain biotech uh pharmaceuticals and therapeutics are revolutionary and like what they can accomplish but they are very expensive and not well accessible to those without money or access or knowledge even of the field mm -hmm. um and there needs to be more active and direct work to translate those new technologies and research to communities who are in academia and who haven't previously had access to it or by historically have been excluded from such technologies. Um, and so without that conscious thinking, technology will advance, but no gap will diminish. And a lot of people think that if you just create technology that will help everyone, then eventually it'll diminish the gap. And I don't think that's a hundred percent true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Going off of that, you know, the big example is um, uh, you can take the vaccines as being a big example where these MRNA vaccines is one of the most revolutionary biotech advances we've done recently where, you know, with how fast genoming has gotten our understanding of vir uh, virology and epidemiology, we were able to produce these vaccines efficiently um, and very quickly. However, they um, do not function if you do not have a minus 80 degree freezers, uh, 80 degrees Celsius um, refrigeration, I believe. And, you know, so we're going to regions um, underdeveloped regions, especially in areas such as like Sub-Saharan Africa or other underdeveloped regions of the world. And these solutions literally don't just don't work with their infrastructure, um, you know, and that's kind of things that aren't um, talked about as, as often. You know, science is thought of commonly as this objective field, you know, very fact heavy, you know, but, you know, it's important to remember that the science being done is still being driven by people and like those people have their biases in addition to those people are going to focus on what they are aware of and so um, it's not important for just individuals to be just educated in just um, more of the public world but also having the diversity of members conducting the science so that they can bring in you know their personal experiences yeah, a small anecdote about this is, you know, I don't want to talk about scary pandemics the whole time, but I know uh, monkeypox has been in the news recently as this uh, very big scare. And a lot of people are saying, you know, oh, it's another one. And when is this going to end or why? Where did this come from? And, you know, it's interesting to note that uh, monkeypox has been a real problem in like sub-Saharan Africa for like many years. And, you know, and even though smallpox um is has a vaccine and is commonly talked about and commonly known and treated uh monkeypox has kind of stayed um silent um and still you know um devastating in these areas until now it's in you know our country and similar and, and similar more developed ones and now it becomes you know this national issue um that could be a problem so remembering to branch out and, you know, get having people from different backgrounds or, you know, thinking about different groups of people when developing solutions is very important in, uh, to us. Yeah, I love a lot of what both of you are saying and what you're saying is very true. And it just makes me think about how a lot of issues don't become issues until it affects the most privileged or the ones who have more power in a society or in just as you were saying in more developed countries and also another point that you pointed out that i remember that we would constantly think back to as i was going through grad school was that scientists are people too as you were mm -hmm. mentioning that scientists are not just brains on a stick 
they, they have thoughts and feelings and biases that they bring into the work that they do. And a lot of that um, is impacted by their own personal experiences too. So those are really amazing points that you brought forth in this part. So moving back to a little bit about school and particularly undergrad, um, so what are some opportunities that you took advantage of so far that possibly help towards the current career goals that you have right now? Um, so I will point out to, um, now that you want to talk about kind of research things afterwards, um, I want to point out uh, that we were fortunate, um, one, just our school, uh, to be able to get into MIT, there's just a lot of uh, resources in general to, you know, um, allowing us to do research early and have access to a lot of um, advanced labs and research. But I want to point out um, our school's um, OME, Office of Minority Education, and how they have a lot of programming um, directed towards helping their underrepresented and minority students um, do well. Two of these programs that uh, stuck out to me and my brother that we did was one called The Standard, which is a recent um, group developed for the, made for the development, uh, professional, academic, and personal development of men of color um, at the school. And so they help with a lot of um, things like identity workshops or, you know, um, how to interview, how to get jobs and things of that nature as well as another group, which is called um, MIT's Laureates and Leaders, which is specifically a group dedicated to helping underrepresented people uh, get PhD, PhDs or MD PhDs in STEM. And so from our about our sophomore year in undergrad, we've been a part of this group and they've helped us mentor us through the grad school application process. And like, what is grad school? I remember when we brought this up to our parents and our family, you know, they said, you know, you're undergrad, we will help you. But for grad school, you have to pay for that on your own. Um, and then I remember one of the first meetings is they were saying that, you know, PhDs and STEMs are usually paid for by the school. And I remember telling and I'm like, and I just remember thinking, like, why is this not more publicly known? You know, I know um, a pure MD or a law degree or some other forms of professional um, schools do, you know, uh, have to pay and many people get loans and such, but um, to not know that a STEM PhD um, is a paid opportunity is something that I was like, I thought that more people should be aware of. And so have knowing that from an earlier age is definitely something that um, Miles and I were able to take advantage of. And that's an important point that you bring up because I'm thinking back on it now when you mentioned that, and I didn't realize that you could be paid to go to grad school when I, until I was an undergrad as well. And so, yeah, it's definitely something that we should be advertising because that, that would help a lot of people who can't, who think they have to like take out more student loans to just get mm -hmm. even higher education when that's not, that's not really the case. Um, We'll talk more about grad school things in just a second, but I want to ask a couple more questions um, related to where you guys are at right now. And what is, I guess, what was the most challenging part of undergrad, considering you're still, you're taking a break because of all of the work that you put in to get your degree. So what was the most, like thinking back on undergrad, what was the most challenging aspect of it? There was definitely a lot of adjustments. Uh, I'm going to try to speak around the pandemic because I feel like that is an experience that everyone has had to work around like going virtual and adjusting that but um, one of the earliest things uh, was just getting <clears throat> used to the trying to be comfortable with myself being one of the very few uh, minorities in the STEM uh, workplace and even classrooms um, we have both been fortunate to be a part of different, uh, several different labs. And in any given lab, I think the most I've seen are two other Black people. And, and it's a very overwhelming uh, experience the first like couple of months of being there and trying to gain confidence in yourself and your own ability when you don't really see anyone. 
you know, walking down the halls and you see the list of professors in a department and there's not a single, um, there's not a single face that looks even like close to mine and trying to navigate a school as hard as ours while <clears throat> trying to build up your own esteem of what you're capable of. It definitely uh, took a lot and it took joining certain groups uh, that are more uh, representation oriented uh, and having really solid friend groups and networks to reaffirm uh, my own beliefs and culture uh, really helped get through the school. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Malik? Mm. Challenging things about undergrad. Um, this is a more like generic note about, I guess, our just programming, uh, not pro like our school curriculum itself. There's a different level of thinking that um, I will say especially uh, research and STEM oriented schools, um, engineering programs expect. And if you aren't exposed to that in your um, K to 12 high school um, education, it's a very big um, jump, you know, where it's um, they parroting as they call it, but the whole, you know, you read the textbook and then the test is just questions that was in the textbook basically thrown out the window. Um, and so there's a lot more um, complex thought and you have to learn different ways to study, things like that. And so getting adjusted to that was also definitely a big um, challenge, especially in the beginning. Yeah, and so some of what you both have said so far actually feeds into my next question, which is how um, do you manage to avoid imposter syndrome and feelings of inadequacy? inadequacy because Miles you were saying that it was very difficult being in a department or being in a program where not many people look like you and not many people identified with your experiences and so you had to seek different social groups you both had to seek different social groups to feel more included or to feel a sense of um, belonging so how what else did you do to manage those feelings of imposter syndrome you know I think um a big part of it is um, just finding your support network, I think is just so crucial. Um, whether it's people in your lab, people in different fields, I definitely have some mentors that are, you know, either from a different subfield of biology or even some that aren't even in the sciences as a whole. You know, I have a lot of mentors from our minor, you know, in the African, in the African and Black Studies, you know, department you know, or even people outside of, you know, professional development in general, but just people that um, you feel comfortable with um, and basically being around people that recognize kind of your worth and who you are out um, despite kind of the negative feelings you get being in these very stressful situations. And then also, and then moving forward from that, also finding allies to also be in these support groups. So even though, you know, there aren't many people that look like us and say these labs that we join, I do know many um, um, mentors and also um, other students that, you know, aren't Black per se or aren't um, underrepresented, but they are also very passionate about um, things regarding DEI and, you know, they make the space more welcoming, you know, and I think finding, finding people like that is definitely very important. By DEI, you mean diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yes. Yep. Yeah, that is very true. I think I wouldn't have made it through grad school without having a support network as well, and also having that so like for my undergrad, I had a very, I had the fortunate experience of having teachers and professors who didn't look like me, but they still believed in me and saw the potential in me and still encouraged me while going through that program. So that kind of gave me a little bit more of a foundation as I was going through grad school where that was definitely not the case. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that you touched on that point because that's very important when it comes to dealing with imposter syndrome. 
But now we're going to move to a little bit more of the exciting stuff, kind of like leaving the heavier parts <laughs> of this conversation to talk more about what you are doing that is so amazing, which is promoting STEM through social media. So what made you start um, the platforms that you're on, like TikTok, for instance, to start promoting STEM through these platforms? So the story uh, starts out of boredom. Uh, um, in 2020, when we all got sent home, uh, we got on TikTok, uh, just see what it was about because we had nothing to do at home. We were like, might as well see what this app's been that most people in my year have been boycotting the whole time. So I got on. That was pretty funny. We started doing some of the videos on it and we got pretty popular. This has nothing to do with STEM. This is just random nonsense that we were thinking of. We got really obsessed within a month on like how to grow and how does the app work and how to optimize video posting, this, this, and that. And between March to August, we grew to 190,000 followers on TikTok. Um, it was very surreal. We had a couple videos hit a, mil had, uh, hit a million views. Uh, it was really interesting, but eventually it got to the point where we didn't really like the content we were making because it just seemed like nonsense. And we really had no sense of community with our account. We were just growing to grow. And so during that junior, uh, during that fall semester, we decided what if we use this platform to try to do STEM communication? It's something that we always talked about when we were younger as a way of maybe uh, we have learned from others that we have a very good way of explaining science in a way that people can understand. So we thought when we got older, we'd maybe try to go into STEM communication. So when we saw that we were doing decently well on TikTok, we decided maybe we can use this to jumpstart. And after a long debate of whether trying to convert our account or starting over a new account, we decided we're going to delete that whole account entirely. It does not exist anymore. Hopefully you cannot find it on the archives of the internet. And we started over from scratch in January of 2021. And within about two months, we gained about 30,000 followers just by making STEM memes and little fact videos and doing little dances that I will never live down. Uh, and from there, it's been a really just fun time talking to many different people. We've talked to like most, our, our, most of our audience is probably high school and college level students, mm -hmm. mainly in biology. who are just like, I never, uh, who just find our content very relatable. Some of our content is middle schoolers who just honestly came for the dances and they start, and, but sometimes they will ask little questions like, what is this science topic? And we'll make a video for them. Others are adults in STEM who are just like, I wish I had these videos when I was growing up and stuff. So it's a really diverse uh, network that we have. We are recently branching to Instagram and Twitter a little bit. Um, one of my personal favorites is our Discord server where we have people join. They can ask questions about like getting into college or different STEM stuff. Sometimes we do game nights on the weekends. Uh, it's been a really fun experience. And from that, we've been able to talk to many different groups and people we've uh i'll take a pause but we've even talked to some schools but it's all come from just us uh making this one tiktok account that has done very well that was beautiful i had so many thoughts flying through my mind and now they're all gone but that just sounds like amazing that you started out of boredom and then you realize like oh maybe we could really do this thing and maybe we could do something even better with it and started over completely to now have this very enriching experience where you are interacting with so many different groups of people from all walks, all walks of life and just sharing the joy and curiosity of science in general. That's, that's really beautiful. So my next question is about the commercial. You guys were in a Windows 11 commercial. I watched it, it was cool. <laughs> And I was wondering, how did you end up with that opportunity? Was it because of your TikToks blowing up or please share the story? Yeah, so uh, disclaimer, can't speak too much about uh, internal the processes, but in general, you know, um, uh, well, their, I guess their talent team, they had a, um, we've had a couple articles written about us, some by MIT um, about kind of us and doing the TikToks and then. I guess they also started seeing our videos and I guess they 
um, liked our mission and, I, and liked how, um, you know, we use uh, videos and technology to kind of um, convey these uh, scientific ideas and encourage, um, try to encourage younger students to get into STEM. And so they, they reached out to us and, um, and it was a really, it was very great op opportunity um, working with them. That is really cool. And yeah, that's just an amazing opportunity to be in a commercial and also because of the fact that you guys are promoting STEM. Um, so it actually kind of leads me into my next question from an adult from DC. And so they're an educator and they just want to know how they can promote STEM among students of color in terms of events and programs, just very like traditional type things. I know you guys are more into the social media aspect of it, but do you have any advice for them regarding promoting STEM? Yeah, so events and programs? where my brother cut off is um, through some of the live streams and the TikTok videos, um, we eventually actually started, we also speak to K-12 um, schools um, about if it's the younger um, grades, we kind of talk about what is STEM, maybe do a little science experiment for them. If it's the older, um, like high school age, we do um, really about what are STEM careers and how to get into college and do and study these kinds of majors. Um, but I would say the biggest thing in general is exposure. Um, you, you find that like people in elementary school, like children really like science conceptually nature and dinosaurs and space you know but then they reach middle school and high school and if they're not they don't if they're if they don't have that same amount of exposure to the next steps it really kind of drops off and ends up on an individual basis and so you know finding ways to get as much exposure especially to underprivileged communities is definitely a, a big start in getting um getting more stem uh, awareness it's so very true that just makes me think about the fact that the only reason why i was able to get through all of this is because i was self-motivated wanting to be in a career in stem regardless of the things i was interacting with they helped they inspired they kept me interested but it is very important, as you were saying, to continue having that same level of exposure, even in high school and possibly in college as well. Yeah. So moving on to my next question. So you told us about your family and teachers growing up being your biggest influences in your life. So are they still your role models and influences now? And do you have any new ones? That you've added to the list um parents definitely still are uh they are very supportive in uh what we're doing even like i said in the uh even in the tiktok realm we would uh we would be filming around the house and we had to convince our mom uh to let us shoot shoot and our creative process can get uh pretty annoying to listen to sometimes um our teachers, some of them we still reach out to today to even talk. Like we've talked to our old high school once uh, uh, since being in college, which I'm really happy to. We plan to do more stuff with our old school district uh, once uh, maybe the situation around the pandemic gets a bit better. Um, and then in college, we've definitely picked up more uh, technical mentors. Um, uh, one of the uh, heads of laureates and leaders is, is the one who really encouraged us into the PhD process. He led the standard and was a part of laureates and leaders. And so while we were in the standard, he was like, when he learned of how much we loved research, uh, he was like, you guys should really apply to laureates and leaders. Um, I think you guys would be great to go into the PhD track. And we really had no idea what that process was like. And sophomore year within about five weeks, we had to decide from well, I guess I'm getting a PhD now. Uh, so um, I'm really thankful for him. And looking back, uh, I'm really, it was really a lot of uh, faith he had in us and he really saw our potential as researchers. 
Um, and then, yeah, some of our leaders of our lab have really exposed us to a lot of cool technologies that have allowed us to do certain conferences and visit different places to see how science is done here and in other places. One internship we did, it, we sh if it wasn't for the pandemic, we would have gone, but we uh, managed to talk and work with a synthetic biology research center out of South Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really exposed us to, you know, what problems are they really tackling when it comes to biotechnology uh, for their country and uh, the continent. Uh, and so it was really eye-opening to see uh, that different experience. Uh, maybe we'll do more in the future, but uh, yeah, it was really good research opportunity that we were able to be a part of. Well, that is an incredible research opportunity. I'm actually quite jealous, but that's really cool. Um, so actually part of what you were saying actually answered a question that I had regarding what made you guys decide to pursue graduate school um, upon finishing your degrees. So I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add to that, Malik, about what made you decide to continue as well. Like, mm -hmm. are you and Miles and Malik just like, are you and Miles just in it together <laughs> until the end <laughs> uh, in some ways yes um in it but in, in addition to uh some some very i guess some very good mentors um kind of pushing us in that direction when we we're looking into it just the kind of autonomy that uh of research you get to do uh, with a phd um i don't know if i want to go into the startup industry world or the or professor in academia after grad school i have many years to figure that out many years but uh until then i just know that you know with that especially in biotech if you want to be designing your own solutions and you know having control over your own projects so phd is really kind of that necessary degree and it also just it also um just opens up a lot of opportunities um even outside of your technical knowledge um it, it really is this um not kind of beacon, but kind of like signifier that, you know, this person is a, uh, it knows how to think and come up with a lot of solutions to a variety of problems, whether they know the field or not. And just being able to go through that process in grad school to kind of go to that next level of learning. It's also very exciting for us. I remember those days of being excited and wanting to take on the world as I'm starting graduate school. So. <laughs> I can see the sparkles in both of your eyes. Um, so actually that leads me to my next question. I know you kind of touched on it, thinking you have a lot of years to think about it. So this is not a pressure to make you think about it now, but um, just in general, not just so much like what you want to do after grad school um, in terms of career wise, but just in general, what kind of goals you have after finally like competing a PhD? Like what, what are you hoping to accomplish aside from getting a job in some field, whether it's staying in academia or working in the industry or something like that. Yeah, um, so I guess one of those um, would be whatever me form uh, it takes, definitely uh, being able to do research that um, helps underrepresented, um, especially uh, black um, communities, um, as, as we brought up earlier, you know, a lot of the bio, there's a lot of exciting biotechnology being developed, especially in the synthetic biology space and making sure that as the advancements progress, that um, they're not going to skip over uh, certain, um, you know, certain groups and being able to design solutions specifically for um, environmental and health disparities that, um, that affects that affects um, our groups. Um, in addition to that, I must probably talk about this more is um, continuing to do some form of science communication and raising um, public science literacy. Yeah, just going off that, we plan to continue the work we've been doing on social media and uh, branching out uh, outside of that. We plan to uh, reach out to more schools to try to talk to students and talk to different people and uh, 
education on different ways to just promote and advertise their programs because there's a lot of great programs for stem and, and getting kids into them we just don't think they're reaching the right audiences you know a lot of web uh, schools are just like it's listed on our website and no one knows uh, and no one would know about that unless you're in academia or you know someone who knows someone who went to the school who did that program uh, and so uh, we have a lot of ideas that we want to bring forward in the next coming years on how to better advertise uh, these programs and how to promote STEM as an accessible and fun career option for communities who historically maybe not have been exposed to it as much. Oh, on that note, I just want to interrupt because I meant to answer it in the earlier question about how to get people involved in STEM, um, especially specifically for high school juniors, but in general for early high schoolers, a lot of universities have these summer programs where they encourage, especially encourage for underrepresented students to go to the school and either take classes or do a mini project. And it really gets them involved in the college process and the STEM process. Mouse and I both did one uh, for MIT our junior years. But many universities, especially uh, large name uh, universities, do these programs and they're very little, they're very little cost, if not free. And so I just wanted to real, real quick uh, plug those in uh, before I forgot. Oh, thank you for doing that. And like you guys mentioning those opportunities or just reminds me of how I wasn't exposed to opportunities like that growing up in high school. Um, and even in college, it was until I hit college or undergrad, that's when I learned about doing research experiences during the summer because our department was very small. And so there wasn't a lot of research opportunities there. So they encouraged us to go out into the world and find research to do over the summer to help us when we wanted to go to grad school. So that's, it's really cool now that there's even more and more programs for even high schoolers to be involved in, to learn more, to see if that's something they want to pursue as a career. So. Thank you for pointing that out. So as we move on towards the end, I have a couple more questions for both of you. Um, one of the biggest questions that I love asking is what does black slash African-American representation in STEM and technology in general mean to you? To me, uh, black representation, I, would love to see an all black or lab or an all minor an all underrepresented lab. Do I expect to see that? Probably not. Uh, I think my I find might be too soon for that. But I'd love to see um, a department that at least reflects the demographics of um, the U.S. or a town like um, it's. There's no reason why in a like 40 person lab, there's only one, uh, there's only one uh, underrepresented group in that lab. And then they might be of only 10 in the entire uh, graduate program. I know those might be dr drastic, but those might be highs for some schools, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. And so I also just want to see more effort being done to recruit to different groups. Again, not everyone is going to go into STEM. Not everyone wants to do STEM. I'm not saying that, but there's definitely more room for opportunity. And I, people in academia can do a lot more to try to recruit more diversity and try to make their spaces seem more uh, inclusive for uh, more diverse members to join. Uh, for me, um, going off of that, I think another thing that I would like to see personally uh, with Black representation is acknowledging the different um, areas of the Black di diaspora. I feel like many groups and schools group um, all of their, you know, Black person statistics as uh, one umbrella, you know, and not... Um, and kind of using that as an uh, as an excuse or a way to skate by some of the um, underlying um, issues, uh, where basically including you know international students or and you know people of Caribbean descent or um, African immigration um, 
as well as African American, um, and kind of lumping them all into one sum, you know, because in certain schools we kind of noticed that the yeah, that the amount of African Americans in universities and getting into research um, is either still or somewhat decreasing as other members of the kind of a uh, black diaspora are i don't want to say replaced because it's not i'm not trying to um say it's their fault by any means i just mean that um kind of um grouping all of the um all of the aspects of the diaspora under one um umbrella term um i guess uh i think um, I think it should be more distinct in, in certain aspects. Those are very excellent points. And I also really hope to see some of those like dreams that you guys have of seeing more of a representation in these different areas of science in the lab, in the department, just at universities in general. So I hope I hope to see that too. And my last question is what advice do you have for members of our audience, particularly the middle schoolers and the high schoolers that want to follow a similar path as both of you? Uh, to middle schoolers, I would just say, uh, be curious and be excited to learn about new things. If you see a cool technology, do yourself a favor, take like two minutes and just look into it more. If you see some uh, interesting technology, look it up and spend two minutes on it and you either will want to learn more or you realize you won't like it and that's a part of learning your interests um exposure is everything and everything you see you are at a time where you can be curious about it and be happy about it um Lee, you want to talk about high school uh in high school our our biggest advice is if you're looking into uh college our trademark not pending phrase is that junior year is the last year of high school so you know senior year none of that really goes on your application so make sure your first three all three of your first years you're really you know putting your best foot forward um and start early looking into schools if you think you like a certain field you know look at schools that are good at that you don't have to stick by it most many people change majors and that's okay you know, but even just knowing what schools um, have a variety of the interests you might have and getting started with that early um, will definitely uh, give you an advantage um, in that application process. Well, Malik, Miles, thank you for your time, for sharing your story with us, for giving us insight into the world of STEM and technology and just STEM outreach in general. To everyone watching, thank you for spending your time with the National Museum of African American History and Cultures through the window and into the mirror, a career conversation series. Thank you all for your participation. And please remember, history is made by doing ordinary tasks extraordinarily well over long periods of time. Thank you very, very much. Stay safe and have an amazing weekend. And good luck to both Miles and Malik as you journey on to grad school. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.